As spokesperson for Kansas City Move to Amend, I am thrilled to be able to announce that the City Council of Kansas City, Missouri, with a unanimous vote, today supported our resolution to uh, amend the U.S. Constitution to say that corporations are not people and money is not speech. Yeah! That's exactly how everybody in, in Kansas City moved to a man feels about it, and I'm thrilled that the audience here tonight does too. We especially want to thank council members Jan Markison and John Sharp for their uh, co-sponsoring our Move to a Man resolution. You know, we do think of it as a bit of a courageous thing when politicians are willing to step out there and go against the big money interests in supporting this sort of thing. Um, yes, because, because, you know, I wish I could remember who that, that famous bank robber was who, when he was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. Well, for politicians, you know, going to the big money sources, whether it is huge corporations or millionaires, billionaires, I mean, that is the obvious, easy thing to do. And so for our Kansas City, Missouri City Council to do this thing, I consider pretty courageous. And But when you think about courage, let's go back for just a moment to the colonists of the United States, what are now the United States. Now there we had true courageous people because they put everything on the line, literally their lives, because to go against the British crown was treason and the penalty would have been death no discussion, and they knew it, and yet they did it. They fought the good fight. But they were not just revolting against the British crown. They were also revolting against the crown's corporations. For almost a 100 years before the revolution, there were British laws put into place that um, basically made it um, smuggling. It was considered smuggling for any kinds of products or resources to go into the colonies that weren't licensed by the British Crown. And who would the British Crown license but huge corporations of the British Crown like the East India Company. And so that had gone on for a long time, making it, it really very, very difficult for colonists in their small businesses to be able to compete. But things went just a little too far when the British did the Tea Act of 1773. And that was one in which the East India Company was given a dramatically better tax rate uh, a duty on their tea than uh, the local merchants were able to deal with. And so that is when the real rebellion started, and that is what the Boston Tea Party was about. Now, when I was a kid and I learned about the Boston Tea Party, it was all about no taxation without representation. And I, you know, I, I just accepted that that it wasn't right for the colonists to be taxed if they weren't getting to vote. But that really isn't what pushed the colonists into this action. It was rule by British Crown corporations as well as 
by the British Crown. And so they put it all on the line, literally, their lives on the line in order to do that. But um, they won. They won the revolution. They didn't know. I mean, for us, it's obvious, right? I mean, we've always known they won the revolution. But they didn't know how it was going to turn out. And they could have all just been killed. Um, but they won. And I am personally very glad that they won. But then they had to form a government. And their first effort at it didn't pan out. So then they wrote the Constitution of the United States the one that we hold as the Constitution of the United States. And clearly it was flawed, but it has been durable because we still, we still live by it. It is the law of the land and has been all this time. And basically the Constitution lays out the structure, the duties, and the powers of the government. That's what it does, as well as the relationships between the, the federal government and states and the states among themselves. And as we all know, the drafters of the Constitution were white male property owners. And so in the beginning, we the people, which they beautifully wrote, we, the people, really amounted to between 4 and 7 percent of the population of the United States. We don't think of that as very democratic, but compared to monarchy, which I suppose they could have set up, well, it's a lot more democratic than that. And um, so that's where we started, in a not very democratic uh, United States. Now, there were some really, some things in the Constitution that were pretty, pretty unworkable and seems like they didn't think through it very well to even believe that, that it might have worked. For example, in the Constitution as written, um, who, in the presidential race, whoever won, got the most votes, became president, and whoever basically lost and got, you know, came in second, was vice president. Well, you know, it didn't take them terribly long to realize that wasn't a good plan for the operation of a government. Um, and there's some others, but I, some of them really have already through the years been um, amended. But in my view, the wisest and most forward thinking thing in the Constitution was and is Article 5, because that is the one in which the Constitution spells out provisions for having the Constitution itself amended. And um, that is really powerful stuff. They could have, yeah. These men who thought that that, you know, presidential election thing would have been okay might have thought the whole thing was okay and was going to last for over time. But no, they didn't. They realized it would need to be changed, and so they built it in, in Article 5. And so basically what that means is we don't have to think about having a revolution you know, actually revolting against the government. No, we don't need to do that, and we don't need to think about anarchy. Um, I certainly don't. That kind of scares me to death. What we need to think about and do is to use the Constitution to amend the Constitution. And to do that, we are going to be inspired by the actions of the abolitionists who fought slavery and won. And the 13th Amendment to the Constitution is the abolition of slavery. It took way too long for it to happen, but it happened. And it took a civil war also, but it happened. And we also can take inspiration from the suffragettes. It took them 72 years from the original Seneca Falls meeting of those brave women in 1848 until 
1920, when the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, was passed. And so they did it. Hmm. We can do it. It is possible to amend the Constitution. And you know, we really don't even want it to be easy. You don't have to go back too far to realize that prohibition, that amendment to the Constitution, that one happened in 1919. And then just a few years later in 1933, we had to have another amendment to repeal it because it was a really bad idea in the way it played out. So we don't, we don't want it to be a, a deal where the Constitution is so easy to amend that uh, willy-nilly, you know, a bunch of Americans can get together and do it. No, it's hard. We need it to be hard, and that is basically a good thing. Um, the, uh, the Constitution has been amended 27 times in the life of our country, the first 10 amendments being the Bill of Rights. And those are for the protection of people, basically against government. And now I realize there's a lot of quibbling over the Second Amendment, and you know, it's not all crystal clear, but by and large, the 10, those first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, are good for people. They are basically democratic. Then, of course, we were discounting the, or the uh, prohibition and the repeal of it. We have 15 amendments left, and some of them are sort of like administrative and don't, um, don't impact democracy too much one way or the other. But several of them really are about rule by the people. As I said, abolition of slavery, that was 13. 14 was citizenship rights for freed slaves, definitely a pro-democracy thing. Then the 15th was an amendment to say that race could not be a barrier to people being able to vote. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's great rhetoric, but obviously it did not come to fruition until 1964 when there was another amendment to the Constitution in which um, poll taxes were um, barred. And so that, that was, again, a very pro-democracy kind of amendment. The 26th Amendment gave 18-year-olds um, gave the right to vote. And most people would consider that a very democratic, uh, and I mean that with a small d, a pro-democracy amendment. So, OK, the Constitution really wasn't that bad in some ways. And there have been all these amendments to make it better and more democratic. So how in the hell did we get Citizens United? I mean, that makes, that makes no sense at all. Citizens United is that Supreme Court decision that freed corporations to spend unlimited money campaigning for or against people running for office. This makes no sense. It was based on two other precedents. One is that a corporation is a person entitled to constitutional protections that we know were intended only for human beings. Yeah, I know, that was bad. And the other is that money is equal to speech and therefore regulating, regulating uh, money in elections is the same as restricting free speech, that good First Amendment free speech right. Well, you know, the fact is it is all just a matter of interpretation. The job of the Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution. When something comes before them, whether it is a law or an action of the president, or when something comes before them, they are supposed to look at it and see how it fits with respect to the Constitution of the United States. And 
I believe they interpret in a very liberal way. And I don't mean left liberal, I mean um, loose liberal kind of way. Um, at the liberty of, my husband can't stand it when I read stuff out loud, but, and I know you're here somewhere, so I'm sorry, but I am going to just quickly read the language in the 14th Amendment. That is the one where uh, corporations supposedly were found to be persons. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Well, did anybody hear corporation in that? But somehow, starting 126 years ago, corporations started being interpreted in to our Constitution. And that is what this movement is all about, the crazy interpretations that that a majority, though a very scant majority, of Supreme Court justices see. The fact is that the word corporation is not in the Constitution anywhere. And so for justices to see it there is pure interpretation. It isn't there. And as for the word money, it is in the Constitution six times. But all of those are in saying the, that the government has the power to issue money, the power to tax for money, and the power to, oh, the duty to account for money. But there's nothing in there about money equaling free speech. That is just a, a fiction um, that the Supreme Court, well, actually, this one came from 1976, but they came up with. And so what this comes down to is that we need to amend the U.S. Constitution. Less because of the actual language in the Constitution and more because the Supreme Court, which are, by the way, unelected people who have more power than anyone else in the United States, but they do have the power to interpret the Constitution. So we, the real people of the United States, we need to amend the Constitution to make it crystal clear that no, corporations are not people and money is not speech. Yeah. Corporations are not people. Money is not speech. Yes, that I appreciate your enthusiasm. Thank you very much. But yes, we need to amend the Constitution to say that only human beings are persons with constitutional rights. And to also, while we're at it, say that money is not the same as speech and regulating it is not restricting free speech. And. In fact, we need to make the language so clear that Justice Scalia will get it. I mean, but the deal is they have to interpret the Constitution as the Constitution is so we can change it. And then the loose interpretations will be no more, at least not on those items. So let's stand on the shoulders of the abolitionists. Let's stand on the shoulders of the suffragettes. We can do it. We need to take back the Constitution to, way, to the way that even the founding fathers wanted it. They weren't 
they did not like corporations. They did not like those British corporations. They would never have wanted corporations to have the role in our government and in American life that they do now. So we need... We need to make the Constitution the, do the document that is of the people. And we, we should do it. We should amend the Constitution. We must amend the Constitution. And we can amend the Constitution. So let's do it.